Hello, everyone. Thank you, Moz, for uh, having me. So I've got a link there with some uh, slides and other resources. I'm not going to mention it again until the end, but I've just tweeted it out as well. So as SEOs and content marketers, I'm guessing most of you have been involved in a project that looked a little bit like this at some point. You send your newsletter, you do your email outreach, you do your social promo. Nothing really seems to stick. So you kind of move on to the next project. You hope it builds up some long tail rankings over the next few months. And even for those projects that do eventually rank, I'm guessing you've been through this sad six month, 12 month waiting period, watching it climb from page five of the SERPs to page three. We've all been through it. Um, as an organic marketer and an SEO at heart, I live for that stuff at the end, right? All the stuff that happens a year after we publish with the tra traffic coming in, that's when it really pays off. But uh, as a content marketer, I need to have better launches that aren't just going to be viral every time, right? So my team has been trying to solve this problem over the last couple of years of how do we launch a piece of content, knowing that a lot of the value is going to come a year down the road, but show some return on investment within a month or two not six months. How do we do projects that look a little bit like, less like this if the email outreach doesn't go well, and a little bit more like this at the beginning, regardless of whether or not somebody at BuzzFeed wants to link to it? So today I'm going to cover eight paid media tactics that we've been using to solve this problem, show faster return on investment on content marketing uh, for the first week or first month after you launch something, and really just make sure that our projects are successful from the day they launch not a year or two years later. The first thing I want you to think about is using paid media for audience acquisition and not just customer acquisition. Now, when I say paid media, almost everybody in the room thinks of paid search down here, right? We have our PPC friends building high converting ads on high intent keywords, people that have their wallet out in their hand ready to buy something, clicking on those ads. A lot of us forget about paid media and paid social at the top of the funnel. I think that's reasonable. Everybody's gut reaction is, well, that, that, that stuff doesn't convert. How am I supposed to get budget for paid media that's not going to drive a sale? That's a waste. It actually can drive conversions. And even when you're promoting content marketing instead of ads in paid social, you can actually drive sales at a similar cost per acquisition to paid search if you can make the numbers work right. And that equation looks a little bit like this. If you're doing a $10 cost per click on the bottom in paid search at a 10% conversion rate, you need to drop those numbers down and be able to drive 50 cent cost per click traffic at a half percent conversion rate to get a similar number of conversions for a similar amount of spend. The difference between these two, and I'm never going to advocate that somebody doesn't do the paid search that's going to convert first if that's uh, not covered already, but the difference between these two, for me as a, a just full funnel marketer, is that I've got another 19,000 people that I can expose my brand to. Those people can love our content, sign up for our email newsletter, and perhaps more importantly, I can retarget to them pretty cheaply for a long time afterwards and start moving them through the funnel. So obviously, a lot of this is reliant on getting those cheap cost per clicks to drive traffic to things like content. I'm going to go through a couple of steps to help you get there. The first part is segmenting your audience and split testing to find the winning ad combinations. Now, a lot of this is not going to be rocket science to anyone in the room that's done PPC before, but bear with me for through the first part. The second part's where it pays off. The first step is we have to segment our audience, right? So if we have 9.5 million people in the US over 40 who are golfers, and let's say we are promoting like a chain of golf resorts or something like that. There's a good chance if we're running ads to this audience that 9.3 million of them don't care. Um, when you start getting into audiences over a half million people, on paid social at least, the majority of them are probably not going to respond to whatever creative you're putting in front of them. The goal is not to spend $4,000 reaching one audience. Our goal here in this method is to spend $400 reaching 10 audiences and give them creative that they actually care about. So maybe we segment down to an audience that looks more like this. We still have people that are passionate about golf and some top golf brands, but now we're segmenting uh, into two groups by gender. We're just focusing on people that live in South Carolina in this example, and we're going to filter down further by behavior that suggests people are frequent travelers or perhaps business travelers. This is the kind of audience that I can reach each one of these for maybe $100 or $300. And more importantly, and moving on to step two, 
I can show them creative they actually care about. If you're a passionate golfer in South Carolina, there's a good chance you're not going to click on a post about the best golf courses you can play in the US. But if I show you one that says the best golf courses you can play in South Carolina, I'm guessing there's a good shot you're going to click on it to see if you've played that course before. So we can put creative together that really speaks to them, gets better click-through rates. That's going to help drive our costs down. Now, the next thing we're going to do in a campaign setting is split test a few headlines and a few pieces of a uh, few graphics for each uh, ad and for each segment. So maybe we have these nine ad combinations. We're going to run 10 or 20 percent of our total content launch budget testing these ads in each segment. So 10 or 20 percent total across all of our segments. And what we're just looking to do is find the winners, right? Whatever has the best click-through rate, the best cost per click, highest relevance scores. We want to pick out those ads for each audience and spend the remainder of our budget promoting that content, right? Those ones that are driving the best results. And the effect that we're producing here is that we spend a small amount of our budget on average CPCs, and we spend the majority of our budget on the winners, right? The ones that are going to have better average results. Again, not rocket science if you've done PPC before. This is a pretty basic campaign template. Where it really gets powerful is when we mix in two things. One is that we're going to be promoting content, which is likely to get a lot better engagement than most um, typical sales-oriented ads. The second thing is that, in at least this example, we're going to do it on Facebook. And we're going to take those winners and we're going to convert them to organic posts in the feed. If I run an ad to my audience and somebody comments on it and likes it, the only people that are going to see that are the other people that I'm showing the ad to. If I take those winners and I post them on my wall and then I choose that as my ad creative, anybody, that same person that likes and comments on it, there's a chance that their friends and family will see it in their feed and we get free organic distribution on top of the people we paid to get it in front of. This doesn't always work. In this example, we paid to get this uh, post in front of 37,000 people. We got around 1,000 organic reach. We probably would have gotten that same organic reach regardless of whether or not this has been sponsored as an ad. No big deal. We still got what we paid for. When the effect does work, it's pretty significant. So this was a post where we paid maybe around $4,000 to get this in front of 750,000 people. And the likes, comments, shares, clicks, from that audience caused it to get seen by another 314,000 people. Now, they all don't fit into our perfect audience. You know, they may not be avid golfers, but it made it through the Facebook feed algorithm, and Facebook thought it was relevant to them, so there's a decent chance that it might be. I'm not going to call this viral, but if you want your content to have a chance at being seen by millions of people, even on a page like this that only had 1,000 likes pre-campaign, this is the most reliable way I know to create that effect without relying on some third party like a journalist to like your content and spread it for you. It's also the most reliable way I know to consistently get traffic in that sweet spot under 20 cent cost per clicks. Five cents, 20 cents, that's a great range. It's certainly possible to do penny clicks, but uh, I, I would quit chasing it at that point and just focus on uh, what's good. Because if you can reach a million people at this rate, there's a good chance you can continue to get some of them to convert, get them on your email list, all of that. So the next thing I want you to try, if you're doing outreach and link building, is targeting influencers and journalists with small ad campaigns before you start your outreach. Now, Phil alluded to this yesterday by uploading your uh, link prospecting list into the Facebook um, custom audience and showing your content to those people. This is similar, but doesn't necessarily have to be video. There are... 66,000 people over age 22 on Facebook with journalism-related job titles, another 35,000 the same age with blogger or video blogger types of job titles, uh, and you can keep going and finding additional ones beyond this. Um, so what I want you to try is running a campaign that looks a little bit like this. A few days, maybe a week before you start your cold outreach, you're going to start showing the content, or maybe you get a good press win early on, um, and you can show off that in an ad so that it's a little bit more of a third-party validation. And the effect that we're looking to create is that when your email lands in their inbox, they open it up and they say, hey, I saw this going around on social last week. This feels like something that has word of mouth traction. There's a good chance that maybe I should write this up before the people at the competing publisher do, or competing blog, or whatever. It doesn't always work, but we have seen just organic links before we even start outreach coming out of processes like this, especially from um, regional journalists and TV and radio influencers and things like that. Um, so very valuable to test. 
It also works on Twitter, but I think targeting by a job title and a bio at keywords in Twitter is kind of a waste of Twitter's potential. I'm not a big fan of Twitter ads, but what I do love it for is that I can target individuals by their username without their permission. Technically, if I wanted to do that on Facebook, I need to have, you know, can spam compliant opt-in to upload that list, right? You're not supposed to do that. But on Twitter, I can go in decision, I can go into follower wonk, and I can start looking up emails, I can start looking up Twitter handles, and I can load those into custom audiences and make sure the journalists and writers that I want to see my content are. And if you only have, say, 400 people in that list, you have to get a few thousand to get over Twitter's minimum threshold for a custom audience. Just load in some of your existing fans or maybe a competitor's followers, and you can get your audience size up and know that a good chunk of those individuals are bloggers, influencers, journalists, things like that. The fifth thing I want to share with you is a way of getting your B2B targeting costs down. So all of you chasing the elusive C-suite or VP level marketers, have logged into LinkedIn and kind of simultaneously laughed and cringed when LinkedIn told you they wanted $20 per click for that person to read your blog post. Um, I don't really feel like paying LinkedIn $20 when I can pay AdWords $20 for somebody that's actually shopping for my product, but I like the targeting they've got. I like that I can filter down to uh, specific size companies and specific industries and that the job title uh, targeting is actually reliable. So there's a good way that we can avoid paying LinkedIn more than once to get that data. We're going to create, we're going to take our best performing content, right, the stuff with the highest click-through rate. We're going to load that into LinkedIn ads. We're going to run it on a CPM bid to help, you know, knowing that it's going to perform well on a click-through rate basis to help get those cost per clicks down, maybe 5 to $10 or even better. And we're going to get that audience to the site once. We're going to attach a parameter or something to our URL so that we can create retargeting groups in Google Display Network and in Facebook ads. And I can continue to market to those C-suite and VP level individuals for 12 months, 18 months, however long the cookie lasts on those networks. Um, that's a really valuable way to use LinkedIn ads without continuing to pay them $15 every time you want them to come to your site. So the sixth thing is a way of getting more value out of your email list. Um, one of our superpowers as content marketers is actually giving people a reason to give us their email address other than discounts, right? Whether it's great content or a great newsletter, whatever we've got going. Um, maybe it's a good opt-in on the site. But we're kind of sad to log into our email platform and find out that 70 to 90% of those people that liked our content don't actually want our emails. That's okay. Those customers aren't dead to us yet we can still get value from the fact that we have their email address. So we can load all of our email haters, the people that love our content and don't want to open our emails, and we can make a custom audience out of them, make sure they're seeing our most important content releases in their feed instead of their inbox. Or if they're not getting the drip campaign that we find is converting really well on email, we can just convert that drip campaign to a series of ads on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever and make sure they're seeing the same messages in another inbox because that's basically what their feed is. We can also take our best customers and our best email subscribers, load them into small lookalike audiences, perhaps do some additional filtering on those lookalike audiences, and now we can do fresh top of funnel marketing to people that look exactly like our best customers, and we can start again right at the top with our best performing content, get those people down to the site, and send them through the same funnel that everybody else went through. The seventh thing I want to share with you is a way of using video for super cheap engagement. Now, Phil covered a lot of this stuff last night, um, but it really works, especially uh, on platforms like Facebook, although all of the social platforms really are pushing video pretty hard. Uh, this is a case study on marketing land that just went live a couple weeks ago. It was written by Aiden Andrus from Disruptive Advertising. Um, I'd recommend you read it if you're interested in video or PPC or paid social, uh, because they went and split tested image ads against various qualities of video run as video ads. They found that even after uh, factoring in those high production costs on video, they still got a 40% higher, uh, higher ROI on that initial lead gen and a 300% higher ROI from their highest production quality commercials uh, when they factored in the full lifetime value of those clients. That's pretty huge. Uh, and that's a B2B example on Facebook. So if you're still skeptical about B2B Facebook, that's a great place to start changing your mind. Now, of course, everybody says, I don't have the budget for video. That's all good. Phil showed you how to do one in all of two minutes on stage yesterday with Soapbox. Facebook has native tools like slideshows being created out of uh, images flipping through. And there's a lot of other great third-party platforms popping up like BigView, Promo, Shaker. 
These platforms exist solely to help non-videographers create short 20-second, 60-second videos that are perfect for social ads. And you can create animated ones, talking head ones, whatever. All of those are great ways to drive your costs down on, um, on multiple social networks. So the last thing I want to uh, point out is that if we're driving all of this paid traffic to content on our site, yes, some people will convert. Yes, some people will sign up for the list. But there's a good chance that 90 to 98 of the percent, percent of the people that we send there aren't going to do that. So if we're not following up with retargeting, we're wasting a lot of these people that are being exposed to the brand. The easiest thing you can do, and this works really well if you have a long sales cycle and you just want to get people on the list so you can continue to reintroduce yourself to them, is to just take whatever checklist or white paper, whatever lead gen promo you had on your site for your email gate, show that to them on Facebook, and maybe test out your other five opt-in, uh, email opt-in opportunities with ads as well if they don't bite on the first one. But if you do have a shorter sales cycle, especially uh, e-commerce types of brands, I think it's important to not be afraid to just retarget for the sale after somebody visits a piece of content. Uh, if somebody's researching backpacking trips and then uh, you happen to sell backpacking stoves, I don't think it's unreasonable to show them a good deal or a coupon. They might be in the market for some new gear before their next trip. So, Wrapping all of this up, if you're willing to test some of these paid media tactics, even at reasonable levels, hundreds of dollars per campaign, doesn't always have to be thousands. If you're willing to take the time to test some of these tactics, figure out what works for you, I think there's a good chance you can go back to your boss or your stakeholders and say, look, we're getting a two-month return on investment from that last big content marketing project instead of 12 months or 24 months. Can we start doing this quarterly instead of once a year? Can we start doing more video? Can we start doing more paid social and see if we can make these numbers improve? Thank you.